Good afternoon. My name is Sylvia Filippini Fantoni. I am the Deputy Director for Learning and Engagement at the Newark Museum of Art. And I'm here with my colleague John and Megan today to talk to you about the development of playful virtual experiences. My name is Megan Douglas and I'm the Manager of Public Programs for the Newark Museum of Art. Hi there, I'm John Sear of Museum Games. I'm a real world game designer, which means I take the skills from video games industry, such as technology and game design, and use those to make games for public spaces, such as museums and castles and car parks and theme parks. Megan and I work for the Newark Museum of Art. For those of you who are not familiar with this museum, it is located in Newark, New Jersey, not to be confused with New York City, which is only about 20 minutes away. It is the largest museum in New Jersey, and it includes a collection of art objects, science specimen, a Victorian mansion, and a planetarium. Before COVID, the Newark Museum of Art was very much rooted in the 20th century, especially when it comes to the adoption of technology. The institution did not offer any digital programs. There was very little use of technology across the organization. That we had no digital strategy, and only one staff member was fully dedicated to technology. The pandemic accelerated the process of change within the organizations, which has now become a much more agile, responsive, community-driven 21st century institution. Key in this transformation was the quick pivot to virtual programming. Because of the pandemic, the museum closed its doors in March of 2020, and we have not been able to reopen since. Within two weeks from closing the museum, we launched our first live program on Zoom. It didn't quite go as expected. We were Zoom bombed, and at the time we didn't even know what that meant, but we didn't get discouraged, we persevered. And since then, we've offered over 200 live virtual programs that served 11,000 people on Zoom and 100,000 live on social media. The first generations of virtual programs that we offer were very academic, sort of more lecture-based, presentation followed by a Q&A, these programs were made available through Zoom and Facebook Live. Generally, we had a positive response uh, from the public, both in terms of attendance and satisfaction. But we did notice that at least our Zoom audience, because the kid didn't really know much about our social media audience, was much older and less diverse than the audience that would come to the museum physically. Keeping this in mind, we sort of started to introduce a different type of program that would appeal to a wider, more younger and more diverse audience. Programs that were more playful and participatory in nature that were based on games, performances, food were key elements of these programs. We made them available not just through Zoom and Facebook Live, but also through other social media channels like Twitter, Twitch, YouTube. And we even experimented with a number of IG exclusive programs. In order to reach the wider audience in the city of Newark, which is very diverse, we also offered a number of programs in Spanish. I'm going to pass on the baton now to my colleague Megan, who's going to give you a few examples of this type of programs. So now I want to talk to you a little bit about the different programs we've created and implemented more play in. Our first one here is called Art Olympics. We really utilize this program um, in a fun way. We partner with another museum or institution, and we really have a battle of the museums. This is an audience-driven museum competition where these two institutions go head to head and the visitors on the Zoom call get to vote for their favorite and they get to decide who the winner is. We pair up these institutions, we give them 11 different categories. They choose one work of art they think best represents that category. Then they have one minute to um, kind of defend that work of art or to describe that work of art and tell the visitors why they should vote for them. So it's very competitive, it's very fast paced. They only have one minute per work of art. And here on the screen, you can see we have an image from Art Olympics. This category was hipster hair. And so you can imagine um, uh, what kind of one minute description we have going on here. But in the top right corner, if you notice our participant here from Birmingham Museums Trust actually had a drawing of what he thought the bottom half of this artwork uh, might look like if we were to pan down and see the bottom half of this hipster. So this was a really fun event that we, um, wouldn't really be able to do quite as, as successfully, I believe, in, in the physical realm. This is really a fantastic virtual competition. It's rapid fire, like I said, it's one minute per work of art. So you see many works of art. You see you know, 22 different works of art throughout the hour long event and you get to vote. So your voice is heard that we find the chat is very lively, very full of comments and questions and um, funny quips as we look through the different works of art. This next program is called Battle of the Cartoonists. This is an election themed drawing competition that we put on last fall. 
during a time in the United States when the election was on everyone's mind, we thought it was a good idea to hire three professional cartoonists to come on to this Zoom competition and to battle it out um, head to head with different prompts thrown at them. So each round we gave them a prompt and they had three minutes to draw a response. Our visitors were then able to vote for their favorite. We've done this style of event in person in the past, um, an event we put on called Art Face Off. And so we know these types of events for our visitors are very popular. And we are actually looking to do another one coming up in the spring um, based around the five different wards that Newark has. So we will be working with an artist from each ward and they will go head to head drawing and our visitors and guests will be able to vote for their favorites. But I wanna move on from these competition style programs that we've been putting on and tell you a little bit about a new entertainment program that we are producing called Art Roast. Art Roast is a sketch comedy night that we are putting on where the sketch comedy is all about our collection. So we have worked with local comedians who are writing original jokes, sketches, um, and scenarios all based around the collection to really point back to what we have and to be able to laugh at it, to have a good time, to um, really poke a little fun at ourselves. And we're really looking forward to this program. We're currently in the works uh, on a program called Murder Mystery. And this is a behind the scenes shot of some of the prototyping we're doing around this virtual game experience. Um, this program, this virtual program is being created in partnership with uh, Museum Games Limited, who John Sear, who you're gonna hear from in just a moment, who also built out our other experience, Escape from the Valentine House. Um, and while this, Virtual experience is not fully fleshed out yet. What I will share with you about this is that it's an experience that's really focusing heavily on collaboration, on science, on giving our visitors an opportunity to explore the physical space of the museum, but they have a fictional cold case murder mystery storyline that they are trying to solve as they do all of these things. So they start out in our upstairs gallery, they solve different puzzles, different clues, they work on different scientific um, scientific experiments. Perhaps they have to do some fingerprinting or some DNA testing. They may have to go into the archives and look for something. They're analyzing paintings. They're analyzing um, documents and maybe old footage. And then we're also going to have characters in the game that they can talk to to ask questions. And these, of course, would be our three different suspects that we think might have been responsible for this cold case murder. The last experience I wanna share with you all is really the reason why we wanted to submit this presentation to Museum Next, and that is Escape from the Valentine House. This virtual experience allows our visitors who may or may not have visited the Valentine House to collaborate, to explore, and to work in teams to escape the home. The premise is that they have been invited to dinner at John Valentine's house when someone steps out from the shadows and asks them to steal the beloved Valentine Ale recipe. You enter the home, you start out in the billiard room, and then you must crack codes, solve puzzles, um, and find clues to move from room to room until you can find the Valentine Ale recipe. This event is done via Zoom. We bring everyone into the Zoom room, we give them a brief orientation, and then we break them out into breakout rooms of teams to, of three to four people. Clues are found using their cell phones, using QR codes, and um, my colleague John Sear might talk a little bit more about that in the next few slides. This experience really allows people to have an experience they would have in person virtually. So if any of us have been to an escape room before, you know, um, you might know what all that entails. And, and this experience really does make it feel as though you're having a live escape room experience. We were able to infuse some science into this experience, um, some Morse code, um, again, we used QR codes. It really had a variety of different technological components to it that made it engaging, interactive, and fun. The experience is about an hour long, and um, overall, we've had very positive feedback that people enjoy um, and like this experience, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that uh, in a few slides. I want to turn it over to John Sear from Museum Games Limited, who's going to take you through a little more in depth how we created Escape from the Ballantine House. But before doing so, I wanted to leave you with this one slide about the process. This is a very oversimplified list of how we developed the game from beginning to end. So with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to John Sear. Thanks, Megan. And thanks to all of you for joining me here live at the Ballantine House, New Jersey uh, via Birmingham. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the game design decisions and challenges 
around building our online escape game. So the, the primary thing is how do we make it still feel like a live immersive experience and all the great things associated with that. So that's really being surrounded by other people, being in a real environment um, and it being a live event. So this is a live event. It takes place over the course of an hour and you buy a ticket for it, much like you would a show. You receive an invite to it. So the story is you as the player are invited to dinner uh, at Mr. and Mrs. Ballantyne's home. And on your way in, you get accosted and propositioned by Mr. Kruger, who you can see here. He's our antagonist, as it were. And his proposition that you can't refuse is to steal the secret Ballantyne beer recipe. So while Mr. Kruger is busy keeping our hosts engaged in the dining room, we have got the run of the house to explore, find the recipe and get back out again. Now, it's too expensive for this to, to do this using a bunch of actors. So our compromise was to use one live host to still keep the idea of it being a live event and then pre-recorded videos of Mr. Kruger. So we do still run this game for a, a large number of people. So it's designed for 30 plus people so it can be used by their education team and we make it feel like there's lots of people involved at the beginning of the game during the mid section of the game where you are puzzle solving and exploring the house we use the zoom platform features of breakout rooms to split players down into teams of three or four they spend that 40 minutes or so puzzle solving and finding the recipe and then the final 10 minutes we bring everybody back together for a kind of finale and a vote one of the main challenges of building a so-called serious game is balancing that educational content against the kind of fun and entertaining experience. Um, and we've got two audiences for this game. One is uh, teams that come through the school groups, uh, through the educational team, and others that come through private bookings, private events, or special events, you know, a wider audience with a non-educational angle, as it were. The simple solution to this is both types of players want a fun experience first um, so make it fun first is the kind of mantra behind all of this obviously that's not what you say to the educational team when you're making the game you say of course it's gonna be very educational but in uh retrospect like players aren't going to take on loads of information i mean people don't if you gave them a book to read about this subject and then sat them a test afterwards um they wouldn't learn loads about it so don't think that just because they're playing a game they will learn loads. It's about ensuring they have a good time. We've only really got 40 minutes, you know, when they're actually with us playing the game, when they can take things on board. So really it's about prioritizing them having a really good experience in that space, really good memories of being with their friends, solving the puzzles, completing the missions, you know, rather than, oh, I remember this fact about that. That's not to say there's no educational content in this. There's loads of educational content all the way through. Every single step of the way is a piece of educational content. I'm just not saying that players will necessarily remember all that if you ask them about it afterwards. I want them to pick up on things like, um, in this example here, we've got a real letter that's sent between John Ballantyne or sent to John Ballantyne from the architect. You know, these are all real names. Jeanette is really his wife and George is the architect. You know, these are real names that people can kind of hang on to. And if you already know some of the history, you can kind of tap into that as well. And likewise, you know, there's an example on the other side, which is the periodic table. That's a real periodic table um, that I've created based on the original ones from 1871. Um, so this is real stuff that you're using. And even in the middle there, you can see there's a little, there's a nod to those three rings are part of the Ballantine um, branding. So everything in the game ties in with history and education. What I've done is I've themed the four separate main puzzles and the four separate main rooms around different subjects. So we've got one about chemistry, one about communication, there's one about immigration. And for each of those, I see them as kind of jumping off points. If the educational team wants to do more educational content, great. The players have played with some of this stuff in the game. They've got a good memory of it and off they go to do some deeper educational things. But the mantra is still true. Make it fun first. How do our players interact during the game proper phase? So at this point, they're already in their breakout rooms. They're in teams of three or four players. And one of those players is designated as the navigator. The navigator is really, they're the real player. They're the ones that are interacting with the game. They're the ones that are clicking on things. They open a website that we've given them, which contains the game, and they screen share that via Zoom to the other players. So they're basically taking instruction from the other players on what to click on and what to do and where to move. So what we're looking at here is 
one of the rooms in the Valentine house. This is the reception room. The players actually start in the billiard room and go to the parlor, the reception room and the library on their journey. And in any particular room, they've got things they can click on and can interact with. This is made a bit easier by the fact the mouse cursor will change as the navigator moves the mouse over different objects. As you can see, we were kind of stuck with the images that existed already for the Ballantine house. So that's why these look particularly busy and there's lots to interact with. So the navigator is kind of clicking on things and moving us around. What are the other players doing? So what we want to do is you want to encourage collaboration between all of those players, or really we're trying to force that, to be honest, from the point of view of the game designer. We don't want players to sit there with nothing to do. We want to get them involved. So if you take any puzzle in particular, if we go back to this puzzle, in any puzzle, you have generally a goal, which might be to figure out a four digit code to unlock a door. And then you have a bunch of puzzle elements. Uh, you put those puzzle elements together once you've found them with a process and that will allow you to get to the code. For example, you might be trying to decipher Morse code. That might be a kind of best important to do. This is a slightly more complicated example that we can see in front of us. Um, so ideally, in order to encourage collaboration, I could share those puzzle pieces out between all the players. You know, I could send them via post beforehand. Unfortunately, that's not possible really. Um, so what we do in this game is we've built a number of micro sites that the other players can go to. So the main screen on your laptop computer, that stays on Zoom. The navigator's busy moving around the house. And when they click on objects, sometimes they bring up some information and other times they bring up a QR code. So you can do that now if you want, perhaps some of you already have done. I mean, QR codes are pretty well supported now. They're in most um, camera apps on iOS and Android. So if you brought that page up on your phone, you would see something like this. You can see on the center of the screen, this is one of the micro websites, and this is a puzzle based around immigration. It requires a number of puzzle parts to solve. So even just having this isn't enough. Um, so you can probably see in this room on the chair and on the table, there are a few puzzle elements. They have numbers associated with them. If you type those numbers into the microsite, of which there are maybe 20 microsites were built for this particular game, uh, you type that code into the microsite and up pops the puzzle elements. Um, in this particular puzzle, you're dragging things around, you're moving the overlays. So if you type in 668, that means that blue puzzle piece pops up, which you can drag around and put somewhere. And if you put it in the right place, maybe you'll reveal something, who knows? Um, and it's my job as a game designer to make these puzzles both, both fun, but also I want you to feel clever. I don't want you to feel stupid when you're playing this game. So I would say they've been very carefully crafted to make the players get to the right answer eventually and have that eureka moment. This particular puzzle requires all those small puzzles and even there's some photos and things around the room. You need to look on the back of those as well. Some of you might even get to, to play this um, later on, who knows? Um, so that's my time up, I'm afraid live here from the Ballantine house. So I'm going to hand you back to Megan and Sylvia, and they're going to talk about the player reception to this game. Thanks so much, John. I know we're all very anxious to get to the live Q&A portion of this event, so I will be very brief with my next two slides, where I just want to point out to you both participant feedback and what we have learned as an institution since implementing these new playful programs. So far with Escape from the Ballantine House, our feedback has been very positive. I won't read you every comment here on the slide, but overall, um, some of the points that stand out to us is there is a learning curve for some at the beginning. Um, so coming into the game, they uh, have to utilize new technologies and work together in different ways. They also um, gave us feedback that they enjoyed working together, that they really did like interacting in small groups to play the game, and that they wanted more time in the game to be able to complete the activities and hopefully find the Valentine recipe. So we're going to take all this feedback as an institution and see how we might be able to implement some of these changes. So what have we learned as a museum launching this game? We've launched um, over 11 games and to totally 248 participants. Each time we play the game, we learn new things. Um, we learn when to help out the players, when to step back and let them continue to struggle uh, as a team. We've been nimble and adapted to various situations that have come up, whether technological or otherwise. We allow more time to participants when that is uh, a possibility. We've also learned that it's possible to socialize in a virtual environment and to have fun doing so. As an institution creating this game and building it with John, we learned about the need for cross-departmental collaboration and buy-in. We've learned how to really leverage this game for revenue generation by using it as a, as a team building activity for private groups to book. And it's really given us the opportunity to rethink museum assets and how to translate that in the physical space and hopefully 
um, when we are able to get back into the museum, we can now think about how do we create escape from the Valentine House in the physical realm as well as the virtual realm. That is really our presentation for you all. We hope now that you'll stick around for our Q&A portion of the session.